Hi, my name is Rachel Wallace. I'm the Aboriginal Program Manager at NADA. Um, today we're going to be, to be doing a webinar on supporting um, Aboriginal drug and alcohol workers in the workforce. Um, before I start though, I'd like to acknowledge country. I'd like to acknowledge the Gadjigal people of the Eora Nation on the lands where I am today and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past and present. So as I was saying, my name is Rachel Wallace. Um, I've been working in the sector now for around 15 years, but I've got a very experienced panel with me today, so I'd like to introduce you to the panel. So first I'd like to introduce you to Lee. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, Lee? Hi, Rach. Um, I'm Lee Lawrence. Um, I've spent about 20 years in, in the industry working in alcohol and other drugs. Um, I've worked in a number of different services. Um, resi rehab is my passion. Um, been lucky enough to work in a few of those. Um, I have um, recently, just yesterday, uh, finished two years working with Kadesh House as their service manager, um, and that was a wonderful experience for me. Um, just taking a very short break, and then I'm going to be starting to do some admissions for um, Watershed uh, down in Berkeley, so um, getting right back to the basics of, um, of Resi Rehab. Um, I'm a very proud Aboriginal woman with strong roots in the, uh, the Jirinja uh, community and also the Wadi Wadi community um, and uh, looking forward to this webinar. Thank you, Lee. Uh, we also have Alan Bennett with us today, the CEO of Arana Haven. Hi, Alan. Yeah, my name's Alan Bennett. I'm the CEO of Arana Haven, Aboriginal Corporation, Drug and Alcohol Residential Rehabilitation Centre about 43 kilometres south of Buwana, near Burke, yeah, north, remote northwest New South Wales. Um, we have a facility that have um, catered for 18 single Aboriginal men, 18 years or upwards. Yeah, um, I started in the sector a long time ago uh, in different roles. Um, first it was um, First, I'll, I'll explain my work experiences. Um, I've been at Iran Aiden for 10 years. Um, I started off as a cook and cleaner uh, and progressed through different roles and learned different roles, which I enjoyed. Uh, they gave me a better understanding, especially in the in my position, current position today, knowing what the workers are doing, their responsibilities, and what they got, the struggles they they will face and overcome or how to overcome them. Um, I first commenced, before I first commenced work in the uh, um, rehab centre here, I had uh, I had 32 years lived experience caught up in uh, addiction. I, you know, I, I didn't go to rehab, I just, you know, um, Still lucky enough to have a little bit of family support, not much, um, but uh, I cleaned myself up. And, and um, at first, when I did apply for a, for a position here, I was just um, just looking for a job, you know. And um, it actually fell into more than that. It, you know, I um, it become a passion. You know, uh, that, that gives me a lot of drive um, to to make things better. And work harder, and um, yeah. And at the moment, Ron Havens, um, we're doing a lot, of trying to fill a lot of gaps out in our area. Um, we are starting this Monday um, our detox program, which okay. I am not sure. The closest one is um, our hospital lab one bed, but um, we're always losing clients, so that's a new part of our program, and we are looking at establishing a a female rehab, Aboriginal female rehab with or without children. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, I, I enjoy my work. Uh, it, I don't actually look at that as a job. It's something I have to do. Mm. Yeah. Now, I think a lot of us in the sector are very passionate about the sector, like working in, in drug and alcohol. Um, so, Today's session is about supporting Aboriginal drug and alcohol workers. So when I first started um, working in drug and alcohol, I started out in an Aboriginal community controlled health organisation, so my background's an ARCHO service. Um, but I first joined ADAN back in 
2011. And I think back then when we when I first joined, a lot of our membership of ADAN were um, workers that we primarily worked in an ARCHO service or we worked in a local health district. So non-government workers, um, there wasn't a lot of Aboriginal workers in the non-government sector. They were really the minority. So I've been now working in, um, in the non-government sector now for about nine years. Um, so I think today's around about like if for non-government sectors or mainstream services, if they've got Aboriginal workers, how best to support the Aboriginal workers? Because a lot more workers are working in mainstream organisations now. So we're finding a lot of the workers are, they're working on teams on their own, like they're working in isolation. Um, so today's, today's webinar is a little bit about exploring um, what service can do to support their Aboriginal drug and alcohol workers, um, especially to retain them on their team. Just some best practice things to put in place. Um, so I just want to ask you as the panel, so um, what do you think the best approaches are for supporting Aboriginal staff in your workplace? Like, what's some things you could put in place to support? Well, I, for myself, I'm, I, I really uh, make an effort to go around and, and sit down and talk with me workers. Mm -hmm. even, even on the, because um, our service runs 24-7, even on the weekends when I'm not in the office, I'll, I'll make a point of coming over to see them. Mm -hmm. And also the various shifts, you know, one hour shift start at midnight through the eight, and I'll make a point that you know, I'll either come over through the morning at times I wake up, you know, just to see if they're okay and have a chat to them and, um, and knowing that, you know, you're there for them, I think. But also, I think would be good um, having some sort of, um, like a, uh, some sort of meeting, mm. you know, teleconference meeting feel where they can log in and maybe discuss with other workers the issues they're going through and how to, um, how to deal with it. Because some other workers may have been there and done that and um, can support them. And it's like all workers sort of jo join a meeting room and um, especially on the, like as with technology these days, it's possible. Mm -hmm. that, that might be a good approach. Um, we find uh, run a, we have hub workers, what we call hub workers that work in the community of Burke, Walden and um, Parks. And it's difficult for the, because uh, the supervisor, their supervisor is mate in orange and a lot of the communication is done by phone. Oh, yeah. And really, as we do, we, we like to have that face-to-face -face contact at times and sit down and have a chat you now. Uh, and, and not always formal, you know. Some people, some some workers like to have that informal chat. They relax. Mm -hmm. They feel like they can speak their mind without being judged or criticised. And I think that's that'd be a, a good way, for, you know, to support workers, yeah. knowing that they can open up to you and, and express what's going on, rather than thinking, "Oh, I better not say that." Otherwise, you know, they'll they'll criticise or this or that or get rid of me. So I think it's important to have that kind of safe space where Aboriginal workers can come together, they can debrief, they can support each other, you know, to have them conversations. Um, yeah, so kind of, I, I'd like to see like kind of regional networks to kind of support workers. So they can come together, say um, every now and again, and just come together and have that culturally safe space. So. What's your thoughts, Lee? Yeah, no, that's really important, Rachel, because, um, you know, working in, we're working predominantly in um, NGOs that weren't Aboriginal specific, and then in, you know, the AMS at the Illawarra, um, you see a really, a huge difference about, you um, uh, cultural uh, safety, I don't like to use the word, maybe competence. Um, you know, in an AMS, they realise that you're working in your community, and I suppose that might probably be the same for Al, is, you know, you're in your community. So there's a lot more uh, debriefing, and it's great to hear that that's what's happening up at Arana, and that's fabulous, because that really supports the worker. Um, it, it's very hard in, a, 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 you know, an NGO, and 
given that I worked at Odyssey House many years ago, 16 years ago, uh, I, a lot has changed up there. But just that, um, that the importance of them understanding uh, the emotional difficulties of working in your community goes along with the emotional satisfaction of working in your community. So when things are great and everyone's doing well, you're good, you're feeling good. But when things aren't so great and you know that that's affecting a whole community, that's a heavy load for a worker to take on. Um, and the debriefing needs to be, it doesn't have to be from somebody indigenous, but it must be from somebody who understands that concept. Um, yeah, otherwise it just doesn't work. Um, you know, just having, um, you know, uh, cultural things in your service, it doesn't mean that you understand your service. Uh, your service understands, you know, your community. Um, so just, uh, I've been developing a diversity package for Kadesh that they can do as their induction. And I presented it yesterday for, um, for the team. And there were things in that that I assumed that these guys knew because they are really good with um, Aboriginal people. They, they've got a fair bit of knowledge about the community in the Illawarra, um, but you know, some significance about trauma, massacres and things like that, they absolutely had no idea about because nobody's telling anyone about it. So there needs to be more of that kind of stuff going into the services it needs to be more of us Aboriginal people going in and going, yeah, okay, you get that we're disadvantaged, you get that we're a minority, but do you get all those things that have affected us from way back when, you know, because you don't know about them, you don't get that. So the emphasis on a worker, an AOD or a mental health worker is, is to, you know, to not fix isn't the right word, but to guide somebody into a better space and then having to take on all the baggage of that person. Mm -hmm. It's a heavy load. And I don't think, especially um, the health services, um, you know, the, the mainstream, I don't think they realise that the workers take on that load. Mm -hmm. And you also touched on a really good point because a lot of Aboriginal workers, they are working and living in their communities. And also sometimes the responsibilities from, you know, the family or community as well as their work. So that is another, um, can be another pressure on their worker. Um, and yeah. you also about that um, having a support. So um, you supervise. So maybe linking your worker up with either Aboriginal clinical supervisor or let them have a, um, a cultural support in the community that they can go to and speak to. Um, yeah, without being questioned or, you know, that you're skiving yeah. off or feeling like I was saying, feeling like you're doing something wrong, you know, like that's, that's the so important, um, very important, yeah. So um, do you want to talk about some of your experiences working as, you know, working in identified roles um, over time? What are you some of, some of your experiences? Yeah, I, I, I have had one um, time that I worked for NGO um, in an identified position. Uh, um, I was under the impression that I was going to go and work for me, work and help my own people, but unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. Okay. All the clients was was handed to me by the um, team leader, and none of them was Aboriginal. Mm -hmm. And the only two Aboriginal clients were on the board, which I queried, and they gave me various reasons why I couldn't work with them. Mm -hmm. They were too dangerous or they had drug and alcohol issues that caused a problem. And this is after, you know, um, sort of leaving, watching them on the, sit on the board for that long. And um, after I realised that, you know, I was in an identified position hired to work with my own people and build those networks, um, which was very difficult to build the networks to our clients at times. 
Mm. You know, um, but so I, I resigned from the position and in return where I'm at at the moment, you know, um, I felt frustrated. Yeah, that, I was going to ask you know, I, I, Yeah, 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 very frustrated, you know, very not sort of, oh, you know, I, I felt that they ticked the box to get the funding for the position but wasn't used in the position what it was there for in the first place. Okay. That happens a lot too. Um, I've actually not been in a designated, uh, an identified role that wasn't with an AMS. So I've only done one des designated role, which was with the AMS. Um, and that, that was obviously, um, you know, a better experience than what I had heard other Aboriginal workers have had in designated roles and, and very similar to what, what Al was saying. You know, you get into the role and you find out that it's a token. It's not a role where you're helping the community um, or, or you get, you know, just kind of left to your own um, with no direction. And and most the most people that I've spoken to um, have just quit because it's, it's you know, it's very discouraging that, oh, great, I can go and help our mob. And then you just kind of get sat in a room somewhere and and given very little, if any, support. Um, yeah, and encouraged, you know, to just do, you know, your basic because you're just really filling, filling a gap that they needed to fill, um, which is a lot of money going to waste. It's very, very annoying. Um, but you know, my experience with the AMS was that I was actually able to do a lot of really good things um, with the backing of you know the CEO at the time. Um, but you know, not always do you get you know not you're not always that lucky to have you know people that even in, the trouble with AOD is that you might have the best intentions on a board anything. Um, whether it be NGO or, you know, community controlled, if they don't have an understanding of what you do in AOD, they're not going to not back you, but they don't understand. Um, that needs to be addressed as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The boards need to know what AOD is about. And while health is their primary care, if, you, you, if you've got a lot of healthy people that haven't got diseases but they're using drugs and alcohol, they're not healthy people. So it, they, it's about time that that's, that started to come together. Um, and I would like Aidan and probably this webinar to, to, to sort of to be able to say that to them. It, it's not about um, you know, us as AOD workers and, and champions, if you like, telling them how to do things. It's just giving them some general knowledge that the two are on par and yeah. unless we yeah, address both, we're, we're not going to win. We're not going to close the gap. Yeah, because sometimes in some services, you might only have one Aboriginal worker or you may have two. And sometimes they're on this team and they keep on that team. And, and the workload of a... Um, a drug and alcohol worker, you do everything, you know what I mean, yeah. for your clients. So it's a lot bigger workload. Um, yeah, it's a good point, Lee. Yeah, it's a very holistic role, you know. You're yeah. getting housing, you're getting employment, you're getting yeah. everything. You're going to court. <laughs> and outreach is really hard because they're not a captive audience. You know, it's very difficult to get them motivated. When they're in the room, they're motivated. And then when they go home uh, and, you know, something goes wrong and they haven't got that on straight away support, it all just falls apart. So you just keep, you keep going back and forward all the time, making very little movement. Um, yeah. He's both brought up some really good points. So what do you think managers should be mindful of or how could they be more supportive of their Aboriginal AOD workers? Communication is really, really important, you know, especially if it's in NGO, you know, sometimes, you know, there's different ways of communicating with Aboriginal workers mm -hmm. and, you know, um, sometimes, you know, I I do hear, you know, Aboriginal workers hear it in, in their voice, you know, the frustration that they really they feel they can express themselves. 
course, they feel that you know they're either um, non-Aboriginal senior doesn't understand where they're coming from. Yeah. Yeah. And that um, may be a good idea. You know, maybe um, having, uh, I suppose, having those organised NGOs actually when they do offer supervision, maybe it needs to be delivered by a co uh, Aboriginal person. Okay. Rather than, you know, just, oh, you're doing supervision and that's it, you know. Um, if they're doing it with an Aboriginal person, may, they may feel more more comfortable to be more open and honest with them. And um, that way the um, person conducting super, supervision might be able to give them some better support how to how to cope and what they can put forward to their um, employers mm -hmm. to make things better. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It, we, we need the NGOs also to realise that, you know, in most Aboriginal organisations, as Al said before, there's a lot of that informal debriefing. Yeah, that's cool. yeah. Yeah, that needs to be able to be accessed for for the Aboriginal AOD worker and some of that peer support um, and for it to be, I know it goes on, um, but it's very much um, uh, a little bit secretive because people aren't sure, am I allowed to do this? Is this going against what I'm supposed to be doing and my supervisor? It needs to be brought up front to these managers and supervisors that it's it's necessary. You know, if you're a, a psychologist and you get a job in a rehab, it goes without saying that you're going to have external supervision once a month for one hour. And I don't understand... <clears throat> Because in a rehab or in drug and alcohol, you're not really discussing anything different to what the AOD people are discussing with these clients. You're not hearing serious stories. You're hearing exactly the same as what the psychologists, the psychologists are, but you're not receiving that, um, that support per month and that recognition that what you're doing is right. And that's got to change in the industry somehow. Yeah, I agree with that. Some more supervision. So I remember years ago, um, the ADAN leadership group used to hold a management managers forum for managers of Aboriginal AOD staff. So um, I think that was a really good initiative that used, we used to do. So... Yeah, I, I, yeah. sorry, Rachel. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, that was one thing I was thinking of. Maybe this... It would be lovely to see some of the peak bodies like that, you know, and um, have some more forums out there for the AOD workers to get together. Yeah. You know, so they can talk and, and make those connections, you know, because it's so important to be able to reach out to somebody. Yeah. You know, when, when in need. And, and that's where a lot of those uh, relationships and connections are developed at those forums. Yeah. But unfortunately, you know, unfortunately, what we hear is, oh, there's no money, we can't do it. No? Um, we've got to find some other way. Yeah. You know? And because of COVID, I think we can find the other way. It's Zooming. That's, that's going to be the best thing that's come out of this whole terrible pandemic is that, you know, we, we can connect and have significant connection without having to spend all of that money or look for that money or ask the government for the money. Um, it's a very low cost way of keeping people connected. And I think moving forward with ADAN, that we, we should be doing this with managers and everybody who's actually in like a member of ADAN, we should be able to then directly meet up with um, or, or schedule, you know, a huge meeting with all of their direct supervisors and talk to them and talk how you, how you can maintain your worker because I'm sure they want to maintain them. Yes. There's many out there. <laughs> um, but you know, and and things things have to change to maintain them because the you know the whole 
um, industry is becoming really overwhelmed with um, with the ice use, and mm. that's just got to happen. We've talked yeah. about that. Go, Alan. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Wasn't there used to be message stick or something like that? It used to be a like a room that you could get into and chat and ask people different um, like questions and you know talk about your problem, what you have I think it was, might have been message stick or something. I'm not sure. Yeah, I remember something like that. Yeah, which which would be ideal yeah. if Aidan could set up a message room or something, um, you know, that where you could just come and go, well, you know, I'm worried about this worker or, you know, whatever. And then you could have one for the workers as well, separate, totally separate. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, when you get a minute, you could just go, yeah, I've got something I need to discuss. Um, yeah, I really, and look, I'm, I'm the least IT tech person in the world. Um, and I got my head around Zoom merely because I had to, and now I love it. It is fabulous. We've talked a little bit about Aiden now, what Aiden does, um, so the Aboriginal Drug and Alcohol Network for um, the workforce. Do you want to tell a little bit more what Aiden does, Lee, and about what they can provide the Aboriginal Drug and Alcohol Workforce, depending on what, doesn't matter what sector they work in? Yeah, so, so Aiden can provide lots of things we can we can provide um information on training or uh standards that are in in you know in, in our particular sector um we can um provide some um information around you know what your employer should be giving you as far as professional development so hr stuff but then we can also provide support just simple straight out support you can contact us there will be you know probably somebody <laughs> who will be able to you know give you an email back or give you a phone call or whatever and then we we have yearly a symposium mm -hmm. that is for get, getting all of the members together for a bit of r and r and a lot of sharing information um they they are just fabulous every year that terrific i'm hoping next year's isn't going to have to be by zoom but anyway <laughs> i'm sure it won't be um and, and you know we also get um around when we do the symposium that's usually when we get people wanting the managers supervisors and that wanting to know a little bit more info about what what do you do where, where are you um so the perfect space to interject that zoom managers meeting would be just prior to that um but any and anything um, you know we do training um as well if you if you are looking at using um, the iris tool at your your workforce we do do training for that um, currently that would be via zoom um, but any just anything even just to have a bit of event about um, you know what's going on in your workplace and we can direct you how to deal with that or even a good story we like good stories you know what's working what are you doing really well we love to hear that and we can pass that through all of the network um, so if you're doing something spectacular and it's not too expensive we can pass that through and we can get the whole of New South Wales doing the same thing for, for our mop you know um, yeah I've heard a lot of feedback like a lot of the feedback coming in about the AD and symposium a lot of workers connect with each other and they meet a lot of other workers you know in other communities and I think that networking is really good because they can share ideas and the relationships go on for years. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. And we've been able to maintain the network throughout all these years. You know, sometimes when a network starts off, it kind of, yeah, it's all about just networking and then it kind of drizzles off and goes in another direction. We've been lucky enough, even now we're incorporated, to maintain that, con that connection through network because it's really important for our AOD workers. Um, yeah, really important. We are a minority within the AOD workers, Aboriginal AOD workers, um, and more and more lately, um, where the government deems a designated 
position for an AOD worker, they'll only let that go unfilled for so long before they go, it's no longer an essential, it's just, you know, um, we, we prefer you to be Aboriginal. So a lot of those designated positions are getting used up by non-Aboriginal people. And that's because the sector in AOD for Aboriginal people needs a big shake up. Mm to bring on the new blood because we're not getting a lot of new younger people. They're, go, they're going off and working with youth, which is fabulous. But um, yeah, the AOD sector seems to need a bit of, um, bit of sugar on top to, to bring in the younger people. So for um, managers who are watching today and want to support their workers to join um, ADN, um, where would they contact? So uh, they can go through the AHMRC, which is Angela Draper and a new girl. Can't remember her name. She's just come on board. Uh, there we go. Yep, I knew it was B something. Um, or they can direct. They can directly um, contact me. I don't mind that. Um, and I can. Once this goes up, I can get them to put up my um, email address. Um, we are looking at creating an ADAN email address. We, we do have a Facebook page. So that's another place where you can go and say, hey, I need some help. I forgot about our Facebook page. Um, but we will have a web page soon as well. So, yeah. Or you can contact myself at NADA as well if you need to be directed in the right way. Um, is there any other points that you feel like you want to share today for managers um, in supporting um, their Aboriginal drug and alcohol staff? Do we have any, do you have any key points you'd like to share? Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with Lee there. We need to um, really start looking at fresh, mm. younger people, you know, because they are they are the next lot to take over, you know. Um, you know and um, without them coming through, coming through the system, you know, um, where do we go from here? Mm. You know, some some way of promoting, you know, because I mean somehow we've got to shake off the stigma of addiction, because mm. there is a stigma out there, you know. You, uh, you know, some people you talk, oh, that's you know um, about. You know, clients, even the clients feel it, you know, um, that the stigma about who they are and where they're at and what they're doing. But I think it comes down maybe ignorance. Mm. Um, some people are, uh, may, may need education on really that, you know, they're just normal people. They could be the person living next door to you, you know, um, but they just run into a few problems that need a bit of help with. Yeah. Give them opportunities to, if they want to progress, give them opportunities. Yes. So sometimes some people get overlooked. Yeah. 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 That's a really yeah. good point. Yeah. 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 You could miss out on a really good work because they don't have that, um, what's in the criteria, but you can also get that really good worker and train them up and you know you're going to have a really good worker exactly we totally agree yeah, yeah I, I think <clears throat> what we need to do is that we need to bring in the new people we need to we need traineeships yeah we need to have traineeships so that somebody can go into it, get fully trained and know what they're doing when they get there. Um, what we also need the managers and supervisors to remember, which I don't think they're aware of, is that most AOD workers who are Aboriginal also have another role. You'll find that most of the AOD workers that are Aboriginal have a caring role in their family. They are the one, and there's usually only one or two in a family of 20. They are the ones who hold together the family. Mm -hmm. They help, they, they manage the family and make sure everybody's okay. It's just their role. 
So then when they take on an AOD role, that's twice as much that they've got to do, but that's just what they do. So being aware of that and not allowing that to interfere, taking that on as, okay, so me, for instance, so, okay, okay, Lee's going to be able to do this work, but then we've got to be really aware that Lee also looks after an elderly mother, some grandchildren who aren't doing so well, and, you know, and, and you know, a sister that may need some help. Like, that, they need to be aware of that and not make people think, well, it's one or the other. Um, you know, what we're teaching people in AOD is to take care of yourself, but take care of your community as well. And we're doing it and we're role modeling that. The managers and supervisors need to be aware and not, you know, disadvantage them at work because they do have other commitments. Um, just be aware of it and be flexible for, for them to be able yeah. to do that. Yes, totally agree. I, I'm, I'm, I'm flexible with my workers. If they need time off or any, I've, you know, I've got one off today. Actually, two off. Uh, personal, personal stuff, family stuff, and I don't have any problem with it, you know, because um, it's something they have to deal with. And if they need the time, I, I have no, I support it all the way. So that's how it, that's fabulous because that's how it. If your workers are feeling good, they're doing what they need to be doing. They're doing great guns at work. Yeah. Okay, um, I'd like to thank you for joining me today for a chat about how to support Aboriginal drug and alcohol workers in the workforce. Um, I'd, I'd like to say thank you. Hi, my name is Rachel Wallace and I'm the Aboriginal Program Manager at NADA. Um, today I've got Stephen Taylor with me, the Alcohol and Other Drugs Field Worker at Wigelli Alcohol and Other Drugs Residential Service out in Cowra. So thanks for joining me today. Stephen, to have a yarn with me about supporting Aboriginal AOG workers. Do you mm -hmm. want to do a little bit of introduction about yourself and how long you've been working in the sector? And So as you said, an Aboriginal field worker it originally started off as a outreach worker, but uh, just changed with uh, funding names and criteria and stuff like that. But um, I've uh, been there nearly 10 years, January next year. So. Okay, wow, that's a long time. Yeah, I'm enjoying it. Just um, just poking along because you get to meet new people every time. Every three months, it's always rotation and get to travel pretty much the whole country, uh, Northern Territory and uh, Tasmania I've been, just okay. promoting service. Yeah, that's Probably pretty hints cool. There. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're talking about supporting AOD, Aboriginal AOD workers in the sector and just some things, um, what you think is important as an Aboriginal drug and alcohol worker that managers can do to support, say, you. Um, so can you tell me about some, what you feel some good support systems that you've had working as an Aboriginal drug and alcohol worker? Uh, I think education, I suppose, if you're coming into the field, like life experiences is good, but I think these days it's all about the paper. You gotta have education behind you. Um, and not most uh, group people, uh, like people person, so they can talk to people just to know what uh, the triggers are and stuff like that, like learning their little nitty gritty things behind addiction, mm -hmm. which is uh, more important. I think education is a big key and, um, and great support, like pushing them to get more education. Yeah, the support as, um, around. As you know yourself, as, you know yourself, as a, uh, an educated Aboriginal person is, worth me and dollars, easy. Like yeah. just the stuff they can bring, the, the knowledge they can bring as well is you know, priceless. Supporting your workers around getting extra qualifications and yeah, supporting yeah. them that. Make them better at their job. They're already part of the community, but just highlighting yeah. the roles a lot more. Yeah. So can you talk about any of your experiences being in an Aboriginal Drug and alcohol position. In spirits is in, in what way? Like um education wise or as a worker. As a worker. Um <clears throat> just doing I think we work work with fellas at their worst, um, coming into into resi rehabs. Um, but then we've seen them at their best as well. So 
Um, I think it's just get to know a person for uh, who they are when you first meet them instead of judging them for what they've done. It's been a big um, changer for me, I think. I think it's a lot of people aren't held, uh, handed the decent, like an easy card like everyone else, but um, it's how they're brought up and, and what, what they think is normal. Drug use is normal when it's not. Yeah. What do you think some of the, um, what's some things that employees of Aboriginal drug and alcohol workers should be mindful of? So non-Indigenous people or? Yeah, who's got Aboriginal AOD workers on their team. You know, I think, right, uh, Abby, go ahead, sorry. No, you're right. <laughs> no, it's like as you were talking before um, we started the conversation, we were talking the importance of um, support networks and stuff like that, so. Yeah, I think if they're good you know, Indigenous staff, I think you you got to understand that they they come from, most Indigenous people come from a big family. So unfortunately, with funerals as, as a big part of our thing, so it takes a toll. Sorry, sorry business. Um, but also getting to know where they're from, they're, what's uh, appropriate in their country, or sometimes workers are off country, so they've got to know how, how to make them feel welcome on country. Yeah. That can be just from a simple smoking ceremony or getting a local elder to bring them, walk them in the country, making sure they're okay. Just yeah. making them feel welcome is probably a big key in making them thrive. Yeah, especially if they're off country and they're working on someone else's country, linking them up with someone in the community, like a cultural mentor, someone that can, you know, support them working in the community. They don't know about the community they're working in. Yeah, they're still going to build the trust, but if they can get that, uh, foot in the door somewhere or making yeah. them feel at home it's going to make them a lot easier you're going to you're going to make your work your work is going to last a lot longer so i know you're on the adan leadership group can you tell me a bit about what adan leadership group um how they support the aboriginal drug and alcohol workforce we've got a there's a really big membership um and they come from different sectors like they come from health um, Aboriginal community controlled health organisations and we've got quite a few members from non-government organisations. Okay, so we try to get um, as many Aboriginal health workers um, together in one place so we can uh, learn from each other but also um, build a good network so um, some Aboriginal uh, workers can uh, are working by themselves so they, they're getting support from other Aboriginal workers as well. So it's a more uh, like a fa family orientated sort of uh, ADM, but it's also work related as well. Yeah. Because um, we, um, I think we need, we, we have, when we do a, like a symposium, we have it, um, we have every aspect of our work in there, promoting the service, what works, what doesn't. Um, and that's a good couple of days where we can reconnect, but also learn what's working, what's not. Yeah. And we've just been incorporated, so it's just, um, <laughs> and Corona freezed everything pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to add on this topic, supporting Aboriginal AOG workers? I think my, um, my biggest thing is, I think, education. Like, you can give them a cert for, but it's, it only does so, so much. I think um, make, make sure they're, they're say, uh, welcome on country, uh, make sure that they, They've got the support that they need, um, but education is a big thing. If you give them more than a cert four, uh, I think it's yeah. well, a diploma plus is what we need. Yeah, edu edu educated Aboriginal people are gold. You can't yeah. can't say much better than that. Okay, thanks for talking with me today, Stephen. Thanks, um, Rachel. Okay then. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs>